Good morning, good afternoon everyone. Today uh, in one of the episodes of talking with philosophers, having dialogue with philosophers, uh, we have uh, Dr. Rekha Navneet with us who doesn't need any introduction when it comes to the kind of work, the kind of publications uh, she has been doing. She is currently an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy at Gargi College, which is in University of Delhi. And uh, she has also been a wonderful senior colleague to me. So uh, before I dig in deeper, uh, Dr. Rekha, firstly, thank you so much for taking our time and doing this interview with us uh, for on the behalf of... Thank you of so much, Rekha. Yeah, thank you collective. so much, Rekha, for inviting me giving me this opportunity and it has been quite the chase i must say because we have been doing a lot of uh, hide and seek uh, in order to make Absolutely. sure that we end up getting a particular slot and here we are so uh, yeah, dr freka uh, before we uh, dig in deeper uh, do you mind telling us a bit about uh, the kind of work you have been doing and most importantly, why did you choose philosophy? I mean, during this time, right now we have been talking a lot about philosophy, its applied aspect, but I'm sure when you started doing philosophy at that point of time, what made you choose philosophy? Or, or was it a stumbling, that a stumbling happened and you became a uh, philosopher? Yeah, more of a stumbling, I would say, and uh, I would rather say it happened to me. And whatever happened to me, as they say, whatever happens, happens for the good. So in my case, it has actually happened for the good. I had got shortlisted for sociology in uh, JMC. And uh, uh, to start with, I was a science student in uh, school and wanted to pursue, even in those days, I had thought that I would pursue a PhD, but in biochemistry. And somehow that sort of a passion is still with me that I still look at bioethics as one of my most interested domains. So, uh, but then I didn't do as well as I expected myself to be doing. And I have been a boat topper in my school in 10th. But in 12th, I didn't get the result as I had wanted. So somehow I thought that I'll change. So I got uh shortlisted for sociology in jmc but somehow it happened to be very very far from my home and in those days with dtc buses there was no connect so when i went to pay the fee my mother had gone with me that was the only time when my mother accompanied me and in those days we never used to take our parents we used to just explore everything on our own so my mother said that how would i come uh, commute so she was finding it difficult so what happened that on while coming back, Kamla Nehru College used to be very close to where I stayed. So it was like I just went to Kamla Nehru. Dr. Shamla Gupta, who taught me aesthetics later, she was there and she said, No, this is uh, actually the last day is over and you have already got in GMC. So why do you want to come here? But my mother told the problem. So there I was, literally, philosophy happening to me and i took admission there and no regrets in fact i feel very privileged in many ways because this is one subject which i find has the most interdisciplinary content in it and be it sociology i mean i have now a very close friend who teaches sociology in jdm and she also studied in gmc incidentally so uh, we connect very well and in any case i mean at the professional level, you can connect philosophy with each and every subject. After all, it's the mother of all subjects or mother of all disciplines, academic disciplines. And the yes, second thing about the kind of work that I'm doing, uh, the first paper that actually got published in my professional career was on environmental ethics. So that was the first paper. But after that, I did a workshop on gender. I mean, not a workshop. I attended an, uh, a refresher course on gender and somehow got interested in it academically. And uh, so I have written a couple of papers on gender. And then Plato, of course, because Plato's uh, dialogues, uh, symposium and Phaedrus were my 
topics uh, were my dialogues for my PhD thesis. I had compared and contrasted these two dialogues with Lucretius's uh, on nature. So uh, this was basically on conceptual analysis of love. So somehow I have always been drawn towards that philosophy which tries to combine that rational abstract universality with a limited sense of application of it. So emotions, you can say reason and emotions. So in a sense of evolution, I have realized that I have actually been working in the field of ethics of care, largely. And aesthetics, of course, since I've been teaching aesthetics, and as I said, that Dr. Shamla Gupta, who, who was my uh, aesthetics teacher, she literally ingrained that love for aesthetics in me, which I continued. And so I have been writing a couple of my a couple of my publications are on aesthetics as well on gender on ethics of care and my recent interest has been philosophical counseling and i have in a way i mean not written directly on philosophical counseling but uh, there has been a paper on uh, this thing bhagavad gita where i have looked at bhagavad gita as a source of uh, as a source model for emotional intelligence during the times of pandemic and also for uh, jindal and uh, springer are coming out with a book and i have a chapter in that where i have used again the traditional indian models that is traditional indian philosophical models for maintaining life skills during the times of pandemic so that's my trajectory so the philosophical counseling was something which I wanted to keep as the surprise, but uh, it's good that you've shown the teaser to the audience. We'll get back to okay. it later. But uh, yeah, yeah. I think just to take away something from what you said, you made a very interesting point that uh, when you were doing your college, it was those times when parents didn't used to accompany you or the students. No for running yeah. and the application yeah. which is changing now because i remember all the times that we have been doing admissions there have been parents coming absolutely waiting outside and still right. we talk about 21st century late 21st century and you absolutely. see how the times are reversing actually so absolutely at, at that point of time as you correctly said that there weren't many dtc buses so the very reason of your mother accompanying you was the fact that there was issue with mobility it had nothing mobility. to do with gender or safety or nothing, nothing like nothing. that yeah, yeah absolutely exactly and incidentally i must tell you that my mother was a full-time working person wow in those days <laughs> wow wow so and that incidentally happened to be a saturday where she could accompany mm, me yeah yeah <laughs> so dr rekha now that you have explained us um You've shared with us a part of our, your past where how philosophy happened to you. I want to know that now as someone who is a philosopher, but at the same time, who is very interested in looking at the applied aspect of philosophy, mm -hmm. right? For instance, the fact that like the very fact that you said that I have, I'm trying to look for certain traditional Indian models and trying to put it out in the public domain to see that this could be the idle way of sort of like living your life or whatever. So I want to know you, I know from your perspective that when we are trying to, when we are trying to understand something like this, something as as fluid yet as rigid as philosophy, then mm -hmm. how do you define philosophy? What is philosophy for you? How do you see it? Okay, so philosophy, I mean, as we all know that uh, academically speaking or a strict, if I speak strictly and uh, if I take from the person who was my uh, content matter for PhD thing, and of course I am work constantly working on Plato's philosophy. So of course, a philosophy in that sense is attributed to Plato with his love for Sophia or wisdom. And, but I, and I look at philosophy as something which is like Socratic, uh, the Socratic way of saying that, please examine, an unexamined life is not worth even. So philosophy has made me internalize at least this thing, that I need to keep examining the life and living at every stage of my life. And of course, Indian philosophy being a darshan as a vision of life and living has made me again 
internalize it. So for me, philosophy will be something which makes me think, look, observe everything. I mean, everything at the abstract level, both at the abstract level and at the lived experiential level. And trying to connect the two, which I think, uh, which I think that philosophy, uh, students of philosophy have a richer vocabulary in connecting the two, both the abstract, logical, as well as the experiential, first person, etc. Hmm. So, Dr. Rekha, I think you made a very interesting point when you're talking about darshan or the way indian philosophy has been uh, described so uh, taking a cue from that uh, i remember too it's going to be almost two years that we are going we are living we have been living with the pandemic and uh, initially when the pandemic started in the first lockdown everybody was doing netflixing and chill because we were like it's such nice time after a point of time because we are human beings after two months we were like what do we do now and unfortunately, exactly. unfortunately or fortunately, everybody ended up, because of the void and the time we had, we ended up reflecting on a lot of things. Something which Absolutely. as philosophers, we have been telling us since ages that you have Absolutely. to contemplate, you have to reflect. And yeah. once people start reflecting and contemplating because there were no weekend parties, there was no weekend getaways, no. bummer, we are hit by the reality, yeah. right? Yeah. And I remember in... At that point of time, I was reading a lot of interviews of therapists and counselors who started saying that they have multiple amount of guests, amount of counselors, amount of counselees, mm -hmm. amount of clients now. And they are trying to mm -hmm. talk to us because many people are grieving. Many people have lost their loved ones. Uh, and especially as philosophers, when we talk about death, we, we sort of like uh, tell the people when we are talking to them that the body would be like, the recourse it's it's the last right. sense of closure which it gives you and during yeah. the first lockdown many people they didn't even they didn't even see that body right because the no. cremation was happening yeah. in a particular manner and then of course the virus and everything it was just so complicated and i remember right. i personally stumbled upon philosophical counseling uh, by american philosophical association and i thought that Wow, I mean, I have been reading, then I started reading a bit about what is philosophical counseling and why philosophers are doing counseling of all. I mean, right. all I know is this, that a psychologist and a philosopher is, is a very, is a very special company. Not? For some reason, I could not understand. I was like, okay, can you, can you imagine a philosopher talking to you for one hour? Okay. What would what would you what would it happen to the person who is getting counseled but <laughs> interestingly when i started reading i realized that okay this is something really interesting and most importantly as you also correctly said that philosophy would be perhaps one of the few disciplines i don't want to say the only discipline otherwise there'll be a backroll about it yeah. but one of yeah. the few disciplines who has characteristically spoken about everything in detail so it is the mother of all disciplines and every discipline has to come to us so Absolutely. i i ended up getting enrolled myself in the philosophical counseling thing and also because i have like a 15 to 16 years of experience being a kathak dancer so oh, i was wow. coming from that perspective of being a bit of aesthetics and because of my work has largely been in feminist philosophy mm -hmm. philosophical counseling gave me the perfect palette to me to, to experiment, to look for my niche. Okay. But uh, I want to know from your perspective that um, you are someone who has published uh, uh, a lot in the ethics of care. You're also someone who is also interested in looking at the applied as aspect of philosophy. So right. uh, do you mind talking to our viewers about what is philosophical counseling? Why should why should people come to philosophers for counseling, most importantly? And uh, how come it happened to you? <laughs> okay. So, uh, like you said that you stumbled upon it. So did I. Uh, but I haven't had any formal training in it, in, in any sense of the word. It's just that, that what happened was that while I was uh, writing this paper on uh, Bhagavad Gita's, and uh, what I wrote was... Uh, Actually, in 2019, I had uh, gone to this uh, uh, conference at uh, Brussels, 
not even Brussels, it, it, it is a small town near Brussels called Brooks. So this was a global conference on spirituality and uh, culture. So therein I had brought in Bhagavad Gita's concept of Stit Pragya. And somehow I culturally associated uh, Bhagavad Gita with mapping a sort of a cultural psychology in the sense that it talks about uh, emotional stability and mindfulness simultaneously. So that happened there and we got talking, all other delegates got talking and there somebody did mention about philosophical counseling and that was the first time I heard this thing that okay, something like this is happening. Then I came to Jindal for uh, a conference on spirituality and uh, management, where again, I tried to develop this idea and then pandemic happened. And when pandemic happened simultaneously, I was also going through a personal process of uh, some sort of an upheaval because my father became critically ill and he passed away in 2021, uh, January of 2021 and someone who has been a very very active person all his life and someone to become ill like that so it was disturbing so i would visit him very often in gurgaon and sitting next to him while taking classes somehow i tried to internalize like you said that we all started reflecting and internalizing and somehow again went back to this thing and in the meantime i was hearing a lot about philosophical counseling from professor bala who was who was still recently the hod and somehow then i started reading about it but still i did not have any chance to become formally acquainted with it until the time this conference on philosophical counseling happened and somehow i thought that we have been doing this over centuries i mean especially darshan or socratic wisdom have been doing the same thing in the sense that we are trying to engage with others through reflection through introspection and trying to introspect together so philosophical counseling to me in that sense is like that where a person can be literally a friend philosopher and guide so friend and philosopher so somebody who's in a state of some sense of an existential uh, upheaval can definitely bring into perspective and can actually contextualize philosophical models or references not even models some references any kind of philosophy but the most related to it somehow i have felt is the care ethics in that sense which can definitely bring in that sense of empathy which is so central to psychological counseling so i have been trying to find something that can connect this ethical side and even then in aesthetics as we talk about ras which is almost like a sahirde kind of an experience so i have in one of the papers which happened much before my awareness about psych uh, philosophical counseling the, uh, this was again in 2020 i had written a paper on this uh, rasa uh, abhinav gupta's theory of rasa so which again the central focus on in it was on empathy that empathy that one forms with the work of art so similarly i think that all these things and uh, all these things about empathy about that connect so basically what we have been really looking for in during the times of pandemic is and what what has hit us all hard is that loss of interpersonal connection in a physical sense and that has really hit us hard and somehow that can also be reflected upon very dexterously if one looks at the self-care kind of a uh, self-care kind of a model which socratic wisdom in apology has been there i mean platonic dialogue uh, apology has been there which has been talked about in sankhya philosophy which has been talked about in yoga philosophy which has been deliberated upon in buddhism as dismantling of the ego self and which has been talked about in bhagavad gita so i mean i'm without getting into that uh, 
dichotomy of heterodox and orthodox thinking in Indian philosophy without getting into the dichotomy of the Shruti and Smriti tradition in Indian philosophy and without even getting into the dichotomy of the reason versus emotion kind of thing which has been so centrally uh, located in the European tradition from Plato to Descartes to Kant to everyone. What we can do is we can find that connect. So that is where I again keep referring to feminist ethics or feminist morality which talks about relationships which talks about intersubjectivity which talks about interpersonal associations and we actually felt the need of it and we still feel the need of it during the current time because we all want to go back to the classroom full of students we want to interact actually without any worries so that is where i see that philosophical counseling is required in that sense and uh, during the conference while the conference was being made there was someone who made a very pertinent comment that the probably the difference between the mainstream psychological counseling which has been happening forever one of course is that that it looks at the medical issue of uh, pathology the psychological counseling that somebody is going through uh, depression or anxiety in the medical sense so philosophical counseling looks beyond that and the second point which was very striking was that it also can happen between people who are ready to understand so in a way in a way philosophical counseling can happen between people who do not have probably that medical issue of uh, mental instability but somehow there is an anxiety existential kind of an anxiety within them but they can comprehend so yeah philosophy does presume some sort of if i can use the word i mean uh, I do not want to but then some sort of an intelligibility in the receiver that sort of a competence in the receiver so philosophical counseling i think is definitely going to be a mainstay in that sense and not only a mainstay it is going to be an equal equally important aspect of philosophizing all right what did plato do after all he also philosophized he used it as a methodology so philosophy can be used as a method methodology in an interaction the basic thing is a dialogue so the dialogical kind of an approach is there in philosophical counseling but i have yet to learn a lot and i'm also thinking of uh, affiliating myself with some association so that i get a formal training in it and to be able to do more in it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Rekha, for educating the audience on exactly what is philosophical counseling and how this is a new avenue which many people can explore. Uh, that yeah. apart from therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists, now you also have philosophical counselors who are ready to help. And uh, uh, it would be one of its own kind of experience to interact, to yeah to do a dialogue because as far as i understood my sessions it's more of like a dialogue which you drew it cannot be a monologue or uh, you know no. something which is just happening in a void so and no. constantly this reflection and contemplation is needed at, as two tools which it's like you know a bummer yeah. telling you okay so think about it think about it think about think it. about it exactly. think about it that, yeah that is where uh, i mean it is said that it needs some sort of a competence in the receiver as well yes that yes. and as you said it the dialogical uh, conversation is very very important probably it's the most significant too and it will just give you probably an awareness hmm. awareness hmm. about the self it may yeah. not uh, be conclusive as philosophy is never conclusive because then yes. we'll not evolve that's true we are not going to evolve so this that's encountering true. with the facticity hmm. and then transcending it is what uh, philosophical counseling is going to do. True. So Dr. Rekha, because um, there were two, three very interesting keywords which you mentioned when you were talking about philosophical counseling, ethics of care, gender, and uh, mm -hmm. most importantly, certain 
gender thinkers if i may say so so mm. i want to know uh, that what do how do you perceive this relationship between um, philosophy and gender do you think that uh, because i remember that many a times when people now ethics of care is out there so many universities right. so many in fact medical colleges abroad they have biomedical or bioethics center Absolutely. and the point yeah. is that you clear a paper on ethics otherwise how would you be mm-hmm. sensitive enough to treat your patient Absolutely. right and Absolutely. that is also creating a very good avenue for philosophy as well to be very honest that's how you understand Absolutely. the applied aspect of a particular discipline but uh, when as a philosopher you try to understand this relationship between gender and philosophy how do you perceive it as as a philosopher as also a professor who teaches to undergraduate students mm-hmm. and if i if i have to ask you the name of few uh, women philosophers i don't know whether women philosophers would even be the correct term to qualify mm-hmm. but gendered philosophers whom mm-hmm. you think right. that you read and it impacted the way you used to perceive philosophy and they gave you different lens mm-hmm. okay so how do i look at gender in philosophy i think as we see that uh, philosophy uh, so, okay so uh, geneve lloyd's uh, definition of uh, that maleness of reason that man of reason so her book actually impacted me her work actually impacted me in the sense that uh, she talks about that reason something like reason which should be in a way gender neutral has been um, has been actually associated with the sexed body so mostly starting with plato to aristotle to descartes to kant to everyone almost except for anachronistically one can say that hume did bring in some sense of an equality because he did not have as much faith in and that intellectual reason or that abstract reasoning or even rousseau for that matter but then rousseau has another issues about uh giving women another role in his social contract and in his education so somehow this pa- point about that why should reason be gendered in that sense or sexed uh, made me think about it then also uh, somehow i have been very fascinated i mean uh, even though uh, it can be an issue of concern but i have been very fascinated with what sarah reddick and nell nodings and virginia held have talked about even nancy chatter have talked about that mothering person or mothering care though it creates kind of a category in the sense that mother care but then mothering has not been sexed according to them that it has to belong to this but collectively if we can look at it i mean uh, this, uh, despite uh, i mean if we can overlook the nuanced kind of a theory but then collectively in a way they have talked about a person who can be kind and compassionate like buddha would have talked about compassion so in a ways thinkers who have talked about compassion and care have really really influenced me and also the thinkers women thinkers who have talked about uh, having a, wom- a woman's agency in a voice like carol gilligan of course even though she's not from psychology but mainstream uh, uh, not from philosophy but mainstream from uh, psychology but lucy rigeri for that matter judith butler for that matter they have talked about women having an agency so that has influenced me and if i go back in time then of course it feels uh, very both very heartening and both very disturbing at the same time that specifically in symposium for instance plato claims i mean that platonic socrates claims that he has been taught the art of erotics by the priestess diotima yet when it comes to explaining the heterosexual love plato becomes belligerent i mean he really really goes against that and for him love can happen only to a male all right a male body so that in a way he does bring in diotima and yet he doesn't give credit 
in women having an agency so i have been looking at these things critically and of course we have uh, the examples of gargi and maitri but again they haven't given the voice that for example shankar has uh shankar even though shankar is a commentator but somehow they haven't given the voice like somebody like yagya valki himself has had so somehow these things have given me a way to think or a food to think and look at looking at the voices looking at voices that talk of compassion and care and relationships so and i have tried to relate those with medical practices with ethics of uh, bioethics and uh, there has been susan sherwin who has talked about this connect between the casuistry ethics in medical ethics via the gender ethics of care so i mean there are multiple layers in through which we can connect and of course somehow i have been influenced like most of us i have been influenced by uh, simon de beauvoir's thinking and uh, about the otherness and i have been looking at how to connect this otherness uh, as well specified by beauvoir and otherness as Lucy Rigiri has brought out. So somehow I see that both of them have been uh, very critical about the ways that women's intersubjectivity has been overlooked. So uh, that has been again an area of interest in my writings and readings. Yeah. So, Dr. Rekha, um, coming back to this gender thing that we are trying to discuss right now. um i remember even in colleges when our professors uh, they used to teach us philosophy uh, there used to be a binary at least in my head and i don't know to what extent it's real maybe because you are talking with us right now so we can discuss it further that we always end up uh, seeing a woman philosopher or the woman professor as a mediator who is teaching us what plato has written what wittgenstein mm -hmm. has written what mm -hmm. aristotle has written on the mm -hmm. contrary every time there has been a male professor in the class uh, mm -hmm. either because of the look or because the fact that we associate objectivity and rationality to a male a particular mm -hmm. male's body that particular person has been uh, established as a philosopher so right. women as being the mediators and only teachers of philosophy irrespective of the mm -hmm. fact that these are also uh, scholars who have done their phd they have publications they are still publishing and right. right now when we look at it in terms of the names you have mentioned and we all have been influenced by these uh, thinkers do you think that there is a gender gap in the indian domain that again yeah. like the way you mentioned that gargi and these two names have been there but even the way a particular male's name has been picturized represented being out there right. that kind of voice has been missing for the women thinkers yes. at least even when we talk about vedic times so but right yeah. now how do you understand this gender gap and that is also one of the few uh, few purposes few objectives which we at collective for women philosophers and india <laughs> have and that's why we decided to form this collective because we wanted to understand from these contemporary philosophers that how do they see this gender gap in philosophy do they even think that it exists if they do then how do they understand the nature of it yeah i would say that yes there is a gender gap in terms of uh, the public representation how many of us i mean if i have to name a contemporary woman philosopher whom will i name i'll say martha nussbaum at the moment all right immediately martha nussbaum's name will come out but again what is her uh, theory her theory is about intelligence of emotions mostly but when i talk of martha nussbaum immediately in a way amartya sen's name comes up because of the similarity of uh, approach and somehow again one sees that there is a sort of a gap or someone like lucy rigiri is gone old but how many of 
how many of the students would know someone like Geneve Lloyd exists, someone like Stevie Jackson exists. I had a privilege to meet Stevie Jackson in one of my Oxford conferences, and I felt very heartened. I mean, it was one of the best experiences in my life that to meet someone who has done so much of work, but then how many of us know her? So, and also what I feel is that in most of the popular universities, including our Delhi University, there has never been a vice chancellor or a dean who has been a woman. I mean, these are small things, but then even if we use the word woman as a category or a gendered category, we have never had privilege of having a woman being a As vice chancellor. Administrator, yeah. That is something which Dr. Oh, Bindu Puri also said in the interview with us, that why you have, why don't you see yeah. more uh, vice chancellors who are women? Why don't you see more chairpersons Absolutely. who are women? Don't you think we need to think Absolutely. on that level as well? We need to think, and I must also say that despite whatever uh, the worldview be about Indian uh, scene, still in Indian Indian academia and in public spaces of uh, India, we have had women participation. I mean, we have had a woman prime minister. We have had women participation. We have had doctors like Dr. Padmavati who headed uh, cardiology at the point of times uh, when women in the Western world, the first world countries, were not even being given admission to medicine easily. So in that sense, yes, we have had women's representation, but again, very few of them. And what actually baffles me most of the times, more than disturbing me, is this lack of women representation in the Indian educational administration. So as I said that, uh, and even most of the universities abroad, I've never heard of uh, women being the deans in uh, popular universities, women being the heads in popular universities. So that is one thing. And yeah, in women's colleges, and again, this category of women's colleges, which is of course, probably the need uh, since uh, we have a, a kind of a diversity in our, demography in uh, and especially Delhi University being one of the uh, primary universities or the central universities it needs to have that uh, that privilege being given to women students so yes over there we have had women as principals because that's a compulsory thing that women only can be the teachers but do we really have the have we really reduced the gender gap by that doing that probably not and one thing which comes to my mind specifically with reference to philosophy is that when we talk of philosophy in the academic scene and especially as an educator what has happened is that again philosophy is being taught in very few colleges so that reduces that width of uh, education and that again brings in the gender thing because since it's being taught in very few colleges so women students are far lesser in number and therefore again the gap bridges between students getting good education and students not getting a good education because if philosophy were being taught in most colleges like some other subjects are we would be in a position we would be in a better position to discuss whether there is still a gender gap in those or not because as we see that uh, in colleges like srcc etc number of um, boys students will be more in the courses which are coveted courses so in that sense i think yeah there is a lesser representation and hence lesser uh, knowledge about them if we can see that so dr rekha do you think that it happens because in general there is a there is a distrust between women's voices and the public space for instance like yeah. I, I don't know even if i have to visit my childhood i remember every time when i used to do something nasty 
even a thousand times my mother used to scold me i never used to take her seriously i was thinking yeah what mm-hmm. are you going to do and the moment she used to say let your dad come we'll have dad. a talk immediately i used to be on my toes i'll be like okay no no because he Absolutely. for some reason the supreme authority has always Absolutely. been a male and right. uh, maybe that is the reason that now so many philosophers like kate main they have started writing about uh, misogyny they have started writing about gaslighting yeah. gas ceiling yeah. why it's problem of mansplaining for instance yeah. so right. do you think that that also happens because in general we like to not trust women i mean i know we are also talking in the current time where there has been a lot of debate whether menstrual leave should be should be given as a leave or not and there are so many women right. also who have been saying that you know if the moment you're going to bring menstrual leave to the table then by default this idea of equality and liberty is going to split that away because yeah. then the people yeah, yeah. are going to say that you are getting certain allowances because of your bodily structure and hence how right. are things equal for instance right. Right. so how yeah. do you see this distrust and this relationship between women <laughs> in the academic world as well uh i would say yeah there has been a distrust but at least in the middle class uh, indian families probably that distrust has is no longer there at least i have seen it uh, if uh, one can use a personal anecdote uh, like you even in our case i mean three of us would not take our mother's scolding seriously as seriously we would take our father's scolding but somehow what i see in my daughter and her father's relation i mean my husband and my daughter they are far more in a buddy buddy relationship than she is with me so in a way uh, in a way there is i see a shift but that could be just a limited sense of uh, a discourse or a narrative uh, yeah there uh, but if i i don't know because in most of the cases that we discuss as friends and i mean within friends and families at least in the household the middle class household this situation is changing but in a larger uh, macroscopic kind of a, a situation yes that is there it is still there and as i said that uh, and as you also rightly pointed out that when whenever there is a male professor or a male boss or someone in an authority we suddenly take it or we start taking it seriously because somehow we are still relating that objectivity with men and some sense of emotional connect with women and we also talk about sisterhood for that uh, for that matter but why can't we talk about a human connect instead of just limiting it to sisterhood or to bromance i mean categorizing or still looking at the binaries if we can talk about interpersonal or interhuman con- connect probably there may be some change and as uh, we know that judith both judith butler and lucy gary have pointed out about this linguistic structures of uh, patriarchy and language so yeah distrust can be due to this linguistic structure as well but i don't know how uh, whether i still see it yeah at least in the public space one can still see that distrust yeah there is a mismatch Dr. Rekha, now that we are talking about mismatch, and we are also running out of time, so I'll club my last two questions for you. Firstly, yeah. uh, a lot has been written about the look of a philosopher. How does a philosopher look? And that is also okay. one of the reason that you know uh, we signify. Um, because every time you think about philosopher, it's the Plato's classic picture or sitting like yeah. this with beard, yeah. thinking, lost, uh, or of course that beard thing qualifies with men for sure. But then yeah. I want to know that uh, there. I remember while having this conversation with Dr. Meera Bhendur, she said something very interesting. She mm-hmm. said that everything, every time people are talking about look of a philosopher, which happened to be a man, so she makes a point of looking like a female philosopher. So sometimes she fancies. hat in her class or sometimes okay. it could be a very dark okay. lipstick which she puts so i want to know that okay. what do you think do you have any eccentric look of how do you like to be presented in the public world as a as a philosopher uh i would say that uh, 
just be myself as it is i mean i have uh, nothing against either wearing too much of makeup or no makeup it's just that how you feel comfortable except that yeah one should not indulge too much in vanity but that i would say that every one should dress up appropriately so an appropriate dressing for a teacher whatever that appropriate dressing for a teacher in a sense of gen neutral gender should be the thing so uh, i won't say that a teacher has to i mean a female teacher has to dress up in pants only to look like a male philosopher no whatever she is comfortable in i mean the comfort dressing for me comfort dressing. because okay. at least yeah at least the uh, body is important to me the looks are important but only important as i can be comfortable with it sounds good sounds good so yeah. uh, dr yeah. rekha this would be my last question to you mm -hmm. that as someone who has had some journey like this uh, of of acting as a philosopher becoming a philosopher what would be your message to all the young researchers uh, undergraduates master students who are our viewers uh, those who are about to finish their phd's uh, <laughs> battling certain kind of anxiety like what what is yeah. what would be your message to all the people who would like to come to philosophy who are in philosophy any final message uh see uh, first of all probably i have not become a philosopher but uh, just exploring so i would say keep your spirit your uh, curiosity alive keep engaging with life critically and meaningfully with your academics also keep writing keep reading more you read more you write more you'll engage in it and that will clarify at least your deadlines to finish your phd have a focus and focus will come only through more reading more writing engaging meaningfully in a dialogue all right so meaningfully doesn't always mean that you have to only talk about philosophy talk about movies talk about whatever you want to talk about girls talk about boys talk about whoever you want to gossip is also interesting but gossip should not be damaging mm -hmm. so engage with life critically and meaningfully i think yeah. the gossip point was something which was a real take away but because we are running out of time we'll stop <laughs> here so uh, no you you're so i just yeah i'll just be uh, use that sentence from david archer's article on the media that gossip if it is in the interest of the nation it's very important oh. but if only it if it only interests individual then probably it's not it's good not. <laughs> so thank you so thank much you dr so. rekha thank you so much for taking out time and speaking to us and uh, to all our viewers uh, i'm dr richa shukla and uh, today uh, thank you so much for watching the episode in the next episode we'll be having another philosopher who would be sharing their or uh, particular concern their concepts on how do they see philosophy how do they see gender gap and all the works all the publications of dr rekha navneet can be found in the biography detail which would be uploaded on our website as well as on the youtube channel thank you so much for your time please stay safe be Be kind thank towards you so each much. other. <laughs> thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so Rekha. much. Rekha. It you. is always a pleasure chatting with you, and thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Thank you, and thank you. Bye.